Master Tavern Keeper's History of the Old World. Anyway, let us continue. In the aftermath of the death of Ketep, king of Kemri, at the hands of Nekomet, the king of the fleet port of Zandri, Ketep's vizier, Gazid, whom Ketep had apparently forbidden from committing ritual suicide, as we might expect, so that he might uh, help his son, the new king, worked behind the scenes to bring the two rival cities, Zandri and Kemri, to a truce with the former given greater autonomy to oversee its own trading practices and a much reduced tax burden. Nekomet seemed satisfied with this outcome and, like the other city-states, Zandri too duly dispatched an honorary delegation to Ketep's funeral. Captured noblemen were returned, but of greater importance to the future, a trio of Druki prisoners captured at sea were offered up as a sacrifice to tend to the dead king in the afterlife. It is from these that Nagash learned the dark arts and began on the road to creating the new discipline of necromancy. Something we have already spoken of. Oh, yeah, yeah, so we did. Anyway, the new priest king of Kemri, Thutep, received the embassies from Zandri and the other city-states of Nehekara with all due respect and honour, and without recrimination. This was a mistake. And he was soon viewed as a weak monarch, at least uh, when compared to Ketep. But Thutep's eyes were elsewhere during this. Of particular interest to him was the woman who was to be his bride, Neferim, from the eastern city of Lamia. This was a traditional and followed in the footsteps of great Setra and his wife, Hatsushepra, a priestess of the supreme god Petra, who was also born in the royal court of Lamia and whose presence had been deemed necessary to preserve the covenant with the gods. Wait, wait. What? I don't understand. Ah, well, I have alluded to this earlier, but uh, perhaps not spelt it out. My apologies. The covenant with the gods was a pact between the people of Nehekara and their gods. Back at the dawn of the civilization of the Tomb Kings, the seven original tribes of Nehek had reached a point of dire need in their great migration. Having left the jungles in the east, they were now in the desert as they tried to reach the rumoured fertile plains that lay in the west. But they were ill-equipped for crossing the desert between. It did not take long for death by exposure and dehydration to begin to cut down the young, the old and the weak. In their desperation, they prayed to the sun and the sky to deliver them. The supreme god, Ptra, was moved by their plight and split open a great boulder within their midst. From this gushed sweet, cool water. The people rushed towards the miraculous fountain and crowded around it to drink, some even crushing others underfoot in their desperation, whilst others cut their hands on the shattered rock shards that lay strewn about. These were the first blood sacrifices to their new gods, and something that would continue. Around the boulder, the city of Mahrak was built, something we shall talk more of later. But the actual covenant between the gods and the people of Nehekara was agreed at Kemri. The covenant was this. In return for worship and sacrifice, the gods would provide the people of Nehekara 
with a paradise, a blessed land within which to live. That was not all, though. It was also promised that the firstborn of each family would have to become a priest in the temples to the gods. In Kemri, the main temple was to Petra, and it was into this temple that the young Nagash had been initiated. That is why Thutep became king. Nagash was already the Grand Hierophant, and no one had ever occupied both positions. The tradition of the king of Kemri taking a wife from Lamia began with Setra after he created his mortuary cult in order to extend his life. This splitting of religious loyalties threatened the covenant, and so Setra took his wife Hatsusepra from Lamia. She was a priestess of Petra, you see, and this satisfied the covenant by having a priest to the gods in his family. Thus, the new king Thutep too took Nephirem of Lamia as his wife. They were married in the river Vitae, now known as the Mortis, soon after the funeral of his father and mother. However, with Thutep as king, things soon began to change, and before two years of his reign had passed, Kemri's rival city, Zandri, was once more gaining in prominence, subtly pulling the rug from under Kemri and its young king. Through double dealing, bribes, coercion and promise, the centre of power in Nehekara slowly began to shift. And like a fisherman pulling up his nets, ambassadors and dignitaries from the cities of Libaras, Rasetra, in the east, and bel Eliad and Bagar in the west were lured to move to Zandri, bringing with them their power and influence. Another two years passed, and Thutep's son, Suket, was born, the first step in securing his line. But power was already slipping from his grasp as Zandri continued her attempts to eclipse Kemri as the power centre of the country. Thutep did not see the changing political landscape, nor the effect his relative inaction was having on both Kemri and the House of Ketep. But his brother Nagash most certainly did, and began to draw up his own plans to preserve the power of the crown. But then, at this point of weakness, when things were already stacked against the city, plague came to Kemri. It ran rampant, striking down rich and poor, master and slave, the bad and the good. It tore through the royal court, leaving many powerful positions vacant. The power vacuum, though, was quickly filled by the surviving nobles, including the nefarious Arkan the Black, whom we've uh, touched on before, but of whom there is yet much more to say. Indeed, for all of those that rose through the courtly ranks, all was not as it seemed, as each was already part of a secret cabal formed by Nagash, whose aim was to seize power and restore Kemri to its primacy. Ach, now, that all seems mighty convenient for your man Nagash there. Are we sure he didn't have a hand in this here plague. Ah, indeed, it would make sense, especially in the light of certain other vile acts that he would perform in the future. And uh, actually, in both the cities of Numas and Zandri, this rumour was doing the rounds, as we say, at least uh, according to some of the scrolls that Ibn Jalaba had access to in Araby. However, this could all simply be the propaganda of rivals. Alas, we will likely never know for sure. Anyway, Nagash, the Grand Hierophant of the mortuary cult of Kemri and his cabal, continued to slowly extend their power and reach throughout the city over the next seven years, just as Zandri did the same in the other Nehekaran cities. It all came to head 1,959 years before the start of the imperial calendar, 
nine years after Kateb's death. King Nekumet of Zandri played his hand, and his allies and emissaries convinced the other cities to raise tariffs on all trade with Kemri, dealing a blow to the city that could shake out the wealthiest nobles and merchants and drive them into the arms of Zandri, emptying the pockets of Kemri. This would either be the death knell of Tutep's reign, or drive them into open war with Zandri once more. A war that Nekemet was sure he could win. Soon after, it came to the ears of Thutep that his brother, Nagash, was also plotting against him. Although, as to whether Nagash meant for him to find out at that particular moment is an unknown quantity. But, bearing in mind what happened, it would not surprise me at all. Why? What happened, Master Tavernkeeper? Ah, well, according to some of the uh, later testimonies of servants in the royal palace, the king, accompanied by his Ushabti, the blessed of the gods, and a high priestess of Neru. Ah, yeah, yeah, Neru, you've told us about the uh, gods of the Nehekarans already, but uh, I've forgotten, which one was she? Ah, yes, of course, it is quite hard to uh, keep tabs on all these uh, different names. Anyway, she was the consort of the supreme deity, Petra, and she was the goddess of protection. Not that it did them much good. Thus supported did Thutep confront his brother in order to apprehend and then bring him to trial. But Nagash was having none of this. He immediately obliterated the high priestess with his unique magical prowess, and then ordered the members of his cabal who had infiltrated the royal court, including Arkan the Black, to attack and restrain the king. This they did, though many died upon the blades of the blessed, but through weight of numbers and their magics, each was overcome. Thutep was now at the mercy of his brother. Nagash once more employed his magics to overwhelm the mind of his younger sibling, rendering him unable to resist anything that the sorcerer might do. Nagash did not dally, and instead buried him alive in a crypt in the Great Pyramid of Ketep, before the next morning proclaiming himself both the High Priest and King of Kemri. A position never held by an individual before. Och, then, again, he very much does sound like our King Macdeath, then. Ah, indeed, I cannot disagree. But I've not quite finished yet. There is a little epilogue I'd like to add to the uh, usurpation of the throne by Nagash. Now, if you think back to the death of King Ketep, it was traditional for the wife of the king to commit suicide upon the uh, death of her husband. But after the apparent death, in inverted commas, and bricking up of Thutep, Nagash did not allow his Alamian queen, Nephirim, to join him. Over in the sacred city of Marach, this caused an outrage in the priesthood, for it threatened the very sanctity of the covenant with the gods itself. This was not unintentional on Nagash's part. Later, he would enslave Nephirim in mind, body and soul, as he had done with her husband, to further disrupt the covenant and disempower his enemies. But uh, more on all this when we get to the war. And so, finally, let us get to the fate of the King of Zandri, Nekumet. Nekumet, the man who had killed Nagash's father and undermined his brother's reign, was now, after Nagash had come to the throne, attempting to rally the other cities against Kemri. There was to be a reckoning, and... The vengeance of Nagash, the sorcerer, priest-king of Kemri, was served with wicked 
coldness. Nine years after usurping the throne, Nagash brought his army to Zandri, but not as his father had done. He did not attempt to storm the gates. Instead, he hid them away upon well over a dozen large mercantile cargo ships and simply sailed into the fleet port unopposed. What? What of the famous standing army of the city? Where were they? Why did they not defend the population? Ah, they were outside the walls of the city, chasing down the cavalry army of Kemri, uh, led by Arkan the Black, a most masterful tactician and the newly appointed vizier of Nagash. Anyway, what followed within the city walls was three days of unbridled slaughter and rapine, which left the streets red with blood and the buildings black with flame. Everything of value was hauled away back to Kemri, and those not killed were taken as slaves, both noblemen and artisan alike. No resource was left untapped. Nagash then marched his army out of the East Gate in search of Nekemet and his army, who had been engaged by Arkan the Black's cavalry. And so, the army of Zandri was caught, and their allies from the north fled after being assailed by spectral visions and doom-laden portents. Their loss left Nekemet little choice but to surrender. These survivors, too, were also sent into slavery, and the king himself sent back to the shattered shell of Zandri, wearing only a sackcloth and riding a diseased mule. It pleased Nagash, the necromancer no end. He always had a twisted sense of justice and punishment, more akin to a vindictive god of the underworld than the sensibilities of a mortal. But let us leave his story here for now, and talk of the other cities of Nehekara in the run-up to the war.